So what is economics anyways? I'm Dan O'Neill, Associate Professor in Ecological Economics at the University of Leeds. And in this lecture, I'm going to explain what economics is all about and introduce you to three schools of thought within economics that are relevant to sustainability, neoclassical economics, environmental economics, and ecological economics. Let's get started. The publication of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations is often cited as the foundation of the science of economics. In 1776, Adam Smith defined the subject as an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. The earlier term for economics was political economy, and Smith described this as a branch of the science of a statesman or legislator with two objectives. First, to provide a plentiful revenue or a subsistence for the people, and second, to supply the state or commonwealth with a revenue sufficient for the public services. So according to Smith, you might say economics was about making sure people had enough to meet their needs and ensuring that government could pay for public services. Almost 70 years later, in 1844, John Stuart Mill gave another definition. He defined economics as a science which traces the laws of such of the phenomena of society as arise from the combined operations of mankind for the production of wealth. The goal has shifted away from providing a subsistence for the people to understanding the quote-unquote laws of society. And this is part of a broader shift to reformulate economics as a positive science, like physics. Physicists were developing the laws of thermodynamics around the same time, and economists wanted to uncover the laws of society in the same way physicists were uncovering the laws of matter and energy. You might say they had physics envy. In making this shift from specifying goals for the economy, as Smith had done, to understanding how the economy works, Economists have often claimed that their discipline is value-free, calling it a positive science, the way things are, rather than a normative science, the way things should be. If we fast forward to the 20th century, another shift has taken place. One of the most famous definitions of economics was given by Lionel Robbins. And if you open a modern economics textbook, you'll find a definition very much like this one. Economics is the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. There is no longer a specific goal here like there was for Smith. There are multiple ends and limited resources to satisfy them all. You'll also find a very similar definition in the most influential textbook on ecological economics by Herman Daly and Josh Farley, who write that economics is the study of the allocation of limited or scarce resources among alternative competing ends. So mainstream economics is the study of allocation, of how we decide where the resources of society go. It aims to understand what we desire and what we're willing to give up to get it. To figure this out, we need to ask ourselves three questions. First, what are the ends? What do we desire? Second, what limited or scarce resources do we need to attain these ends? And third, how do we decide which ends get priority and what resources are allocated to them? Economics is usually divided into two broad branches, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics focuses on the individual parts of the economy. It studies how businesses and households make decisions and how they interact in specific markets. Businesses make decisions about their level of production and how many people to employ, while households make decisions about what they consume or buy. A microeconomic study of the coronavirus crisis might consider how people's purchasing habits change during lockdown, you know, a sudden interest in buying toilet paper, or the shift of businesses towards more online technologies. Macroeconomics studies the economy as a whole. It explores system variables like GDP, unemployment, and inflation. A macroeconomic study of the crisis might consider how the reduction in consumption has affected economic activity and with it the number of jobs available. 
or how the creation of new money might impact inflation in the long term. One critical thing I want you to realize is that economics is not a single unified subject where everyone agrees on all the ideas. There are many different schools of thought and they sometimes have quite fierce disagreements between them. And I want to introduce you to three that are particularly relevant to how we think about sustainability, neoclassical economics, environmental economics, and ecological economics. But this is not a definitive list. There are many others, such as behavioral economics, Marxian economics, post-Keynesian economics, and feminist economics. But let's start with neoclassical economics, the 900-pound gorilla in the room the main school of thought in economics today, and it's what you'll find being taught in most economics departments. It evolved in the late 19th century when technology was allowing for increasing mastery over nature, and its creators wanted it to be neutral and value-free, like physics, as I mentioned earlier, a positive science that defines a set of laws that govern economic activity. And according to neoclassical economics, forces of supply and demand interact in markets to achieve optimal outcomes for everyone. And even the language of forces is, is borrowed from physics. It equates welfare in society to the consumption of goods and services. And because of this, it advocates continuous economic growth. The bigger the economy, the more goods and services, and the more that people's seemingly infinite desires can be satisfied. And it's highly concerned with the idea of efficient allocation. Efficient allocation is kind of a funny idea to wrap your head around. It's not efficiency in the sense of getting the most output out of a certain input, like in the natural sciences. In economics, efficiency means that scarce resources are used in a way that matches people's preferences. And people's preferences are expressed by what they're willing to pay for these resources. From a neoclassical point of view, efficient allocation is best achieved when there are free and competitive markets. Next up, environmental economics. This is an extension of neoclassical economics that brings the environment into the picture. And it largely developed during the 1960s and 70s as environmental issues were becoming more prominent. It recognizes that besides consumption, people's welfare also depends on the ecosystem services provided by nature, and that this welfare can be negatively affected by pollution. Environmental economics argues that environmental problems are the result of market failure, of markets not functioning the way they should. And there are a number of different types of market failure, but a particularly relevant one for the environment is externalities. An externality is a cost or benefit from an economic activity that does not affect the person conducting the activity. And externalities can be positive or negative. The pleasant smell from a bakery making bread is an example of a positive externality while the CO2 produced from burning fossil fuels is a negative externality. The solution to environmental problems, according to environmental economics, is to ensure that markets take environmental costs and benefits into account. This could be done, for example, by creating a carbon tax, so that emitters of CO2 have to pay the social cost of this externality. If they have to pay it, then they'll pollute less. And from the perspective of environmental economics, environmental problems can be solved by quote unquote, getting the prices right. Now, prices communicate information and the idea is to extend the price mechanism to encompass the environment. But not everyone agrees that environmental problems can be solved this way. In the words of John Barry, environmental economists may be criticized for economizing the environment rather than ecologizing economics. And this brings us to ecological economics, which was established as an academic discipline in the late 1980s. It attempts to unify ecology and economics, and both of these words come from the Greek word oikos, meaning household. Ecology is literally the study of the household, while economics is the management of the household. And ecological economics 
starts with a different pre-analytic vision than neoclassical or environmental economics. It views the economy as a subsystem of the environment. The economy is part of society and society is part of the biosphere. Whereas environmental economics applies the tools of neoclassical economics to the environment, ecological economics applies the tools of the natural and social sciences to better understand the economy. And it argues that many environmental problems are caused by the scale of economic activity exceeding ecosystem limits. Scale is a measure of the total matter and energy flowing through an economy relative to what the containing ecosystem can handle. And ecological economics suggests there is an optimal scale or size for the economy beyond which growth may become uneconomic. And by uneconomic, I mean that the costs of more growth exceed the benefits of more growth. The cost of the environmental degradation is greater than the benefit of the stuff we get out of it. To paraphrase Herman Daly, one of the founders of ecological economics, we are concerned with scale, which means limits, distribution, which means equity, and efficiency in the order given.